All right, I am going to officially begin, although whatever that means. That just means I pressed record. All right, we're, we do have some new blood here. So I'll just share kind of what I like to get out of the discussions. And as we go around, we can, of course, introduce ourselves. But I like that these discussions are opportunities to ask any question. I always have a subject ready, but I think it's a great opportunity. There are questions that people haven't had an opportunity to ever ask, or maybe we're a bit shy about asking, felt a little judged. And so I like to take away that stigma of Jewish questions here. And so any question goes because of that, you might not like some of the questions. And so if you don't, it's your job to kind of get the new steer of the conversation. Please. I don't know. We'll see soon. <laughs> Time will tell if anyone has become shy that used to not be shy, right? People change. <laughs> so I, I do want to, um, just open up the floor, but welcome back to some of our um, returnees and a welcome to our newbies. And I do have one person on Zoom. So if Karen speaks up, we'll make sure everyone hears her questions. But yes, yeah, so you already want to start with a question? With your permission. Of course. And I'll ask an religious question. Of course. Um, I'm Orthodox and I'm down in every morning. And I keep calling my notes. Anyway, okay, I'll tell you in a second. I'll, I'll, the whole government, the whole clan, about sacrifices in the and you do morning and you do evening, and five times a day. I skip it all because I only put the loans in the government. Am I doing something wrong? There's two ways I can answer this question, but just to repeat the question for a moment. So, in the prayer service that we do daily, even on holidays and Shabbat, most times you come to shul let's say services start at 9 30 you're actually not starting from page one of the book in most synagogues you're starting let's say from page 30 there are all these preliminary prayers i'm going to use that word the preliminaries that lead up to the prayer service those are typically about different sacrifices that were given daily or on that day that you're reading the prayer so if you're reading the morning prayers you have the morning sacrifices that you'll be reading about of the temple service if you're reading the afternoon prayer, you'll have the afternoon sacrifices. And if you're reading the evening prayer, there are no sacrifices because that's not when sacrifices were given in the temple. So you're really reading about the daily sacrifices. What's a morning sacrifice? So morning as in M-O-R, not M-O-U. Right. Right. Yeah. It would be the sacrifices that were given in the morning. Well, what would they be? Example. There was, okay, so in the temple, there was a sacrifice called the Tamid. So I'm just giving one example. That was given every single day. Tamid means always, if I was to translate it loosely. And so this is one of the cows or bulls that would be sacrificed every morning. Oh, so not, it's not sacrifices that we make now. It was, no, exactly. But prayer, it says, when the temple was destroyed, it says we now offer sacrifices through our lips. Meaning we read about the sacrifices. So not to get into why you believe it should or shouldn't be, that part of the, I think is irrelevant. The question that he's asking is, is he's doing something wrong by skipping it? And so I, there are two ways to answer this question. There is the, the way that I would tell most people is it's beautiful that you're praying. And so you're doing the meat and potatoes. And so great. You put on tefillin, let's say in the morning, checkbox, you prayed. Did you do all the prayers? That's additional. In general, prayer that we find in Judaism has two parts to it. One is it says an individual should pray. So there is no script. On the other hand, when the temple was destroyed, we had the, the great assembly of the, of the rabbis that instituted a structure to prayers. And so the short answer to my question, to your question is, great job, you're praying every day. The longer answer is, is there is a reason or a tradition of prayer. And part of that is what it leads to. That's a bird, right? A bird. Or it's right on top of the roof. But the other answer is, is that these prayers are part of a ladder. And so it's kind of preparing you as you ascend the ladder. But I wouldn't tell you that you're doing something wrong. I think you can do something more, right? It's not, I don't look at it as uh, all or nothing. Can I comment? I have some rabbi in my community. He said we will? Yes. That's a quote from my Rabbi. I, I have a problem with listening to a human being 
talking about the one who happened in who knows when about something that I personally already don't believe. In. So I'll tell you something interesting since he quoted Maimonides, Rambam. Maimonides actually is quoted twice in his works. And in one, he says, we will have sacrifices. And in the other one, he says, we won't. So I just want to put that out there. But I'll share kind of there. If we talked about sacrifices for just a moment, I think that's really what you're getting at. You have an issue with sacrifices. If I was to really kind of unpack your question, it's not about should you be praying it? Are you doing something wrong? It's more like I don't sit, you don't sit well with sacrifices. So like you don't want to read about it. I always love this line. I, I do have not with me in front of me a text, but. There was a class that I taught. It was called um, Jewish Course of Why. And I have 50 questions in there. It was a JLI class. So if anyone has ever taken it, it's a great class. And each question kind of was its own independent question, but some of them flowed when they would choose for each class, let's say five to 10 questions. They kind of touched each other, but not necessarily. One of them was about sacrifices. And so I think for many of us, we look at sacrifices and we definitely are maybe a little uncomfortable because it's not something that we see. It's not something that we're accustomed to, but I like something that they said in the class, which I think is kind of the same struggle you have. It had this flip. It said it used to be that the entire world did sacrifices. And so sacrifices was never something that bothered people. What bothered people about the Jewish people? That we cared about the elderly, we cared about the infirm, we cared about the sick. Because that was like, wait a second, the, the society at that time was, why are you investing time into them? They're worthless. That was So they had a problem with Jewish people with the charitable acts that we did. The poor, what are you working on them for? Give people, invest in people who invest in society or who produce and give to society. So sacrifices never bothered them. Eventually that flipped. And then people said, I don't get sacrifices, but to be kind to the less able Oh, that's such a beautiful thing. So the way I look at kind of the question after I read that text was more about, for us, it makes sense that it doesn't make sense because we never, we don't live in a society that does sacrifices. And so we don't really get how an animal by putting it on an altar and slaughtering it and burning it is going to appease God. So there is, and this is what Maimonides tries to address, which is why he has two different answers regarding sacrifices. When he talks about sacrifices in his major work of Jewish law, which is called the Yad HaChazaka, that's what it's known as, there he talks about sacrifices that it's going to happen again. When he talks in Guide to the Perplexed, the people who were struggling with faith and struggling with questions like this, he had a different answer. He said, listen, it made sense then, but we won't need it anymore in the future. Right. Why did he allow it then? Here's the fascinating thing that he answers there, which I, I think is quite fascinating. He says, humans are very big creatures of habits. The Jewish people come out of Egypt and God is giving them an entire set of rules, a religion. All they knew was everything up until that point. And everybody did sacrifices. So if God would say, we don't do sacrifices, then possibly the Jews would say, what type of a religion is this? And make a revolt. So therefore, God included sacrifices in the rituals. But when Mashiach comes, this is how Maimonides writes, in the future Messianic era, where we're, we're, we won't be worried about these types of fears. We won't have sacrifices. However, is that the answer or not? It, that's not the point, because he's talking to a specific group of people that struggle with that. So if that works well for you, you have an answer from Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed. I also, yes, I also like this idea. It's called error on the side of caution. <laughs> it's like, what are you going to lose an extra five minutes of your day by reading it? Uh, but I'm not telling you what to do. Of course, I think the most important thing is, is that an individual prays. And so you're doing prayers. I'm not telling you that tradition is not important. And obviously a lot of things that we find in Judaism, we have reasons to. And then there's a portion of the things that we do that we don't get. Sometimes there's a reason and we don't understand it. And sometimes there is a reason that is never given to us. And so because of that, I share that in this instance, maybe it doesn't resonate with you or talk to you, but it could be it's something that's much greater and more important. So that's what you have to struggle with. Yeah. We live in a world today of change. 
where things that were important are no longer the most important. Right. So, yeah, if you believe that putting a cow on a pile of fire was important a thousand years ago, what is the equivalent of that in today's world and modernize that sacrifice? Okay, you are touching like a huge bomb question in a good way, right? A lot. 100% society changes, time changes people, time changes society. And so this is the age old question on, I'm going to say really on Orthodox Judaism or on keeping Jewish life the way it was a thousand or 2000 years ago today. It's like, wait a second, why do these laws need to be kept? We've changed and we should really be with the times. And so that's really, that's why I say your question, we could talk about sacrifices specifically, but really that's a much bigger question. Is the Torah's commandments still relevant today or can we change and make them more to our living, if I can use that kind of a thing. So really the, before anyone answers that question, the questions, each one of us who have that question have to really ask the question to ourselves, where is my question coming from? Because I don't like it. It would be an easier life if I didn't have to do it, or it, it, it's just part of it. We just have to, you don't have to tell me your answer. I'm saying this is something we each have to, Shabbat, it would be so much easier if I if I could drive, I'm just using that example. And so I, I think that what's the car is not working by turning it on. It's actually not work. And the Torah says no work, but that's not work. That's one example. Or kosher, right? It's so much easier to go to every restaurant and not have to say only there's only four kosher restaurants in Phoenix or five. And of those five, I only like two. And so where am I going to eat out? Right. So we each have to look at that question and really address the questioner, the person asking the question rather than the question itself. The Torah is very clear. If we believe that God is God, who sees the past, the present and the future as one, then any law that was in the Torah is as relevant today as it was relevant then. That's the short answer, right? Because God sees the big picture. Unless God said this is a mitzvah for this specific time. The sages, we could talk about in another kind of chapter, if you want to call it that to this question. Let's talk about just divinely inspired commandments. So sacrifices would be one of them. Kosher would be another. Shabbat would be another. And so in that regard, the question is, Yes, times have changed, but that doesn't mean that the mitzvah change. And so I am going to say that I'm very comfortable. Sometimes it's not easy living with some of those mitzvot in a modern world and applying them to this life. It's a fascinating thing. It can be done. And so when you look back at all the different um, Jewish groups, to use a very nice way of saying it, that have changed and said, oh, you don't have to do that, or this is not important. Really, the question is, why? why did they change it? Why did they remove the obligation? Was it out of convenience? And they said, you know what, which is, a, there could be a warped logic and say, listen, if we don't force that, people will still come to shul. If we don't force that, people will still do this, which is kind of lowering the standard rather than lifting the people, right? So there's two answers that I answered in your question. One is you're doing it wrong. You got to do that first 10 pages. The other answer is it's so beautiful that you're davening. Maybe you'll find meaning in it. Maybe you should err on the side of caution where you're not lowering the standard. You're still saying that's an important prayer, but it's a beautiful thing that you're praying. So the messaging is very important. And so if we look back, just to use one little detail that I do know about the reform movement's kosher changes in the 19, early 1900s, they said that if we do not require people to keep kosher, we'll actually solve anti-Semitism. That was part of its reasoning. Yeah, worked. Their theory was... You'll eat with your neighbors, you'll socialize with them, and they'll appreciate you as a person and see past the religious problems that they have that you killed Christ, if I could use that as the example. It didn't work. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so that is, I just share that, like we kind of have to look back why they're saying that. So I've always been taught the better message is, listen, a person should say, listen, I'm not there yet. Those are important Jewish traditions. They're important Jewish laws. I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm always growing. That's just not where I'm up to. And so this way, you know that that's an important thing. It's just 
not me yet. So it's, am I looking up or am I looking down? I think that's an important uh, frame of reference for that question. Well, going to picky poster for one second. Sure. You can't boil the kid in the mother's milk or whatever that is. You know, they're not talking about a kid, right? <laughs> no, no, it says kid. I was just, you know, making sure everyone here is on the same page. <laughs> you said she would, I think, the kid. Oh, my boy. <laughs> Um, I get that for them, but now we have pasteurization of milk. We have all kinds. Of Hold on, what was the reason for then? I'm just curious. So there are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is you just killed the mother. Don't kill the child on the same day, or the flip side, right? Don't kill the child and then use the mother's milk. Why do you have to kill the mother to get the milk? You don't, but you're like really in your, now you're just being so disrespectful to what you just did to the mother who lost her baby, the animal. So there is a compassion side to that. There is also a, we don't know side to that. God said, you don't do this, but most people will attribute it to compassion. The sages are the ones who addressed it and said, you know, we got to go way beyond the literal law because you could end up in this law. A chicken doesn't have milk. We talked about that one. So chickens are a rabbinic prohibition. That said, it looks too similar to meat. And so people make that mistake. So this is really about meat, right? The mitzvah in the Torah is about meat. But the way that we play it out today is that you can't do, you can't do a chicken burger with cheese either. And you can't do a turkey burger, which is why did we go all the way to chicken? Chicken aren't poultry is not meat. And the Torah is very clear in how they call animals relative to how they call birds. It's a totally different category. So why did we apply it all the way across the board? That was for confusion. We didn't want people to, I'm going to use, I'm going to use you as the example. You keep kosher. I don't know much about kosher. I see you eating a hamburger with cheese. And I'm like, oh, my kosher friend does it. I'm also allowed to do that. I thought I can't do that. And then I didn't know that that was a chicken burger. That's kind of the idea behind that. So it's chicken burger? Not, oh. according to, not according to Jewish law. From the Bible, before Jewish law gets unpacked and applicable, the answer is you could. Yeah. Why doesn't that apply to the impossible burger? sitting there eating a nice looking hamburger all right you, by the way this is a great question it's bigger than just the question that you asked if we just applied this idea that someone could be misled by mistake then maybe i should do it across the board now they come up with fake meat which is totally vegetarian right not even from an animal maybe i should say you shouldn't have that with cheese because it doesn't because we did the same idea with chicken so maybe i should apply it to impossible meat um, there are, there's a couple of parts to this answer, but on the basic level, which is, I love, we don't extend a prohibition on another prohibition. So this was a rabbinic kind of worry. We don't add that to the next level. That's number one, which is good. Cause if not, we would be eating nothing these days. Number two is there's another thing that you find in the Jewish law standards about milk. So it says that we know that milk comes from a cow and therefore you don't eat that with any meat items, poultry or whatever else. What about oat milk or almond milk? So the Torah, the rabbis allowed it, but they still said, put something out there that shows people that this is from almonds. So if you're having almond milk in a pitcher in those days, put out a bunch of almonds on the table. It's not milk, it's cheese. Correct, but we were afraid, we were still afraid that somebody wouldn't know better and see but their- this is the example. So nowadays, though, where it's so prevalent, it might not need the same, but it's still probably a good idea. Like here, they call it impossible burger rather than burger. In fact, in Israel, I think it was last year, and we might have even touched this. I thought it was a little interesting. There was a kosher organization that's, that gives the certification to restaurants. I think it was in Tel Aviv. They refused to offer a kosher certification to an entire restaurant if they didn't change an item on their menu. On their menu, they wrote bacon. 
So was, let's say eggs and bacon or something. I don't remember what the dish was. They said, if you keep it as bacon, we're not certifying your... I remember the story last year, right? They wanted to say fake bacon or something that it was noticeable, even in the words. Again, that's an extreme standard. And the beauty of Israel and America is, okay, if you don't like that one, get another one. But if that's a good one, you probably want to listen to them. So your customers who only want to use that kosher standard are going to come to you. But it was just an interesting thing that they didn't even, here it says impossible burger. A restaurant that says cheeseburger and it's a meat place, you might you might be hesitant. It's like, wait, is that place really kosher? Till you learn that it's fake meat or fake cheese, whichever. That's many years ago. There was a cheese that wasn't a cheese, but it was uh, They still have that. I don't see it in the, in the stores anymore. But anyway. They have cheese that melts really well. Like that's kind of, now that's the standard. If I'm getting a fake cheese, I want it to melt. Right? That's kind of what people want. Doesn't have to taste good, just as it melts. <laughs> yeah. I have a name for what you have mentioned. I call it the Morris effect. Morris, I I call it the Morris effect. So the Hebrew, just to, I'll jump in. Oh, you could share, you could explain. Morris, I'm trying to detect. It looks like doing the wrong thing, but it's not doing it, I can do it. That's what's called Malachi. What the eye sees. Malachi meaning what the eye sees. And that's the Jewish law kind of concept for... And I have a problem. I'm riding a scooter on Shabbos, but this when they made the scooter, they made a specific... Oh, you got You finally figured out how to get to Shul now? I remember we were talking about this. But, okay. But the interesting thing is, you know, while I have a big sign on the back, and it says, this is a Shabbos Kula specially designed for Shabbos, and he signed his name. And I asked the guy who was more he puts it on, and he says, I can't, I can't tell you, I can't give you that school unless you promise to have the sign on. And I understand that. My only problem is if you go and start in the back, well, I some shots. I can't have lights and shots. You must have turned it on and shot. But now you know you don't have it on. So we're telling people, we realize, oh, this is a religious guy. He probably has a catalog and he's done many things. And this is one of them. Change, what you said, change with time. But this is a very different change with time. So just to repeat what he was talking about, I'm going to explain. There is a, an amazing institute in Israel called Somet. I think that's who... Good friend of mine, Scott. Okay. So a lot of people who live the religious lifestyle are very careful that just because medically or age-wise it's difficult to walk to Shul now or something else, and a scooter would be the instant fix. The problem is a scooter is operated by an individual yourself. That means when I press the gas on the scooter or however yours works, I am actively engaging a circuit and the circuit is the issue for Shabbat. Completing a circuit is an issue for Shabbat. That is considered building. I'm going to bone exactly. I'm going to go backwards in that to explain it in a minute, but I'll, I'll just, yeah. So I'm going to get to this in a second. So there's an organization in Israel that has dedicated all their engineering to enabling and helping people in these types of situations. So they created, for example, the Shabbat elevator. The, the, the technology behind an elevator is that if I go into an elevator, I need to push a button and that elevator now will lift me or lower me to whatever floor I've selected. The problem is, first of all, I can't push a button because I'm now actively engaging that it will now lift, close a door, all of that. Number two is elevators typically use different power depending on the weight that they feel, right? It needs more power to lift. And it's it's a process within the technology. So they've done a couple of things. Number one is the Shabbos elevator stops at every floor. You don't push any buttons. You walk in. If you made it in time, great. If you didn't, you didn't. I don't know how they do safety on the doors, but they probably tell people stay away from the door so it doesn't close on you because if you stop it, it's going to open. But in addition to that, 
besides for the stopping and starting, typically I think they say when you're going down, it requires more power. So that I remember reading about elevators because it's breaking the whole time. So whatever the case is, they've made it that it always uses its optimum power all the time, right? So they've come up with the technology for it. Now, if you are religious, you'll either use that or not. You'll either look at that as, listen, it's nice that they did it, but they're still using a number of exceptions in Jewish law that are a little bit lenient, maybe. And so you'll use it based on what you need. If a person is older, they might use it, but a younger person might take 13 flight of stairs. I'm just using that as an example. If you are worried about that, others don't worry, so they do it. The same thing as with the scooter. Like, here is a person who needs a scooter. Why should they suffer on Shabbat? When socializing is important, community is important, synagogue, synagogue is important. And well, that's what this is. This is an electric wheelchair, but completing a circuit is still an issue. Trust me, it's not a gas wheelchair. I haven't seen one yet. Right? It's not about fire. This is about completing a circuit, which I'll get back to in a minute why Shabbat, that's an issue. With that, not everyone would know that this is a specially designed and created wheelchair that works specifically for Shabbat. And I'll explain the technology in a minute. And so he said that even when he bought it, the person who sold it says, we're only selling to you on a condition that you leave a sign on it that says this is a Shabbat scooter. So people don't start thinking every scooter is fine. These are not cheap scooters, by the way. They're, they're more expensive, but how much more? A thousand dollars more. So you have it. So here's the, the, is, the issue with the scooter on its own and how this fixes the problem. On, in the Torah, we learn about the 39 melachot, the 39 categories of prohibitions that are considered work. I'm using the air quotes on purpose because a lot of us just assume work means hard work. Schwitz is how we define work. That's not how the Torah defines work for Shabbat. In the Torah, there, you'll find two types of words that they use for work, avoda and melacha. On Shabbat, melacha is prohibited. That's the word that they use. They don't use the word avoda. Avoda what might be shoveling and plowing. It might include that, but melacha is something to do also with the mind. It's, it's a little bit more complex. So Shabbat prohibits creating something to completion, building. When modern technology, coming back to your question originally, when modern technology began to grow, the Enlightenment period, manufacturing, electricity, the truth is when they first created the light, the light bulb, religious Jews were turning on lights. They said, this isn't fire, and they can only assume that a bulb, the issue would be fire. It's a filament, whatever you want to talk about, Thomas Edison's light bulb. But then they started addressing it a little differently. They said, hold on, let's understand the technology of the light bulb. What are we doing when we flip a switch or pull a string in those days, right? We are connecting something and completing a circuit. And so now they start analyzing it with the Jewish eye, which in my opinion is quite fascinating. I don't have a case example here for you, but I love this idea. In the Talmud, when they have a case study and they're trying to figure out what is the law, they throw things at it. Maybe it looks like this case that we already know. Maybe it looks like this thing that we already know. And then the rabbis argue with each other in a good way, though. It's debate. It's not argument. They debate with each other. Does it fit the case that you are trying to compare it to? And when you look at the Talmud and you're like, why do they argue so much? Really, what they're doing is... They are making sure that the glove fits, to use our friend from California, right? They are making sure that it fits completely. And this way, if it does, if it does fit, we know he's guilty, <laughs> right? It does. But the idea is, is that they are trying to make sure that the case study that they're using to address the law fits. And so that's where you have all the debate. Somebody says, yeah, it fits, except what are you going to say about this detail? This detail is very different. And that's the back and forth. So the same thing is with modern Jewish law. When we have a new development, a new technology, a new invention, like the light bulb, at first, people didn't understand how it works. Just use it. And then the rabbis are like, hold on, let's try to understand the technology of it. Electricity goes through this wire. 
and it has to create a circuit. It has to create a circle to make the light bulb turn on. So that's when they start understanding there's a little bit more to the engineering side, and that fits to a prohibition of the Torah, which is bona. I'm using the Hebrew word for it. And so that is the debate. And then they say, okay, don't use light bulbs. So wait a second, hold on. I'm not, I'm not jumping to timers yet. This scooter has the same problem. You push, first of all, turning it on. So let's say turning it on, we can figure out. We'll just leave it on the whole Shabbat. But what about giving it some gas, right? Giving it some power to go. Now you're talking about opening and closing circuits. I, I stop, I open the circuit, I push, it closes it. The more I push, it gives it more electricity. Meaning we can work on these things, but this is part of the idea. So now how do they solve this? There are two ways that you can solve this. One is you make sure that it's always giving power and you now are just kind of opening the valve and closing it and how much, or maybe you're literally releasing a break, by the way. There's, there, there are different ways that they could address it, right? It's always giving the power. Your finger just releases the brake a little bit, or I'm just giving you examples. I don't know how theirs works. That's the that's why. No, why would that be work? To release the brake. No, because again, define work. Well, the pushing the button on an elevator is work. But this is mechanical. I'm not doing any digital, any electronics. Well, it's some a, circuit has to close if you're going to. That's if my brake is electric. Right. We now have modern cars. How does your emergency brake look? It's a button. Most people. I have two cars. One is newer than the other. My newer car, my emergency brake is a button on my console. My older car is still that foot pedal. That's mechanical. That's that. So let's say that they solve this scooter issue. Again, I don't know how his scooter works. And this is why they are a fusion of engineers and rabbis. That's what Somet Institute is. So I'm just talking from a dumb version. My version without going into engineering is this is always on full throttle and I am releasing a brake, right? Simple, something simple. There is another way to do this as well. So that's one option. Another one is what I am going to call grama in Hebrew. Grama is cause. The Jewish law says, Jewish law, biblical law says, Shabbat observance is by direct cause. If I push the button and it makes it go, I push the gas and it makes it go, that's a problem. But what happens if it's a delayed system? What happens if it doesn't work direct action? It's indirect action. Only the rabbis say that's a problem. The Bible doesn't. The rabbis were afraid, same idea. If you allow this, someone's going to misunderstand it and allow something else. So this is a category of grama. I'm going to share now where this plays out in Phoenix in three different spots in the valley. You are walking to synagogue and you have to cross a busy street. Six lanes. Cars fly on these streets. They're busy lanes. They're busy streets if it's got six lanes. So a normal person pushes a button on a crosswalk so that there's a red light. And then people will be able to cross the street safely, right? You still have to wait for cars to stop. But in the end of the day, this is the solution for safety. Well, on Shabbat, we have a problem. I can't push the button. So they start thinking and say, wait, wait, wait. What about a weighted sensor? Which is also common. But it's also- they say, wait, exactly. If I walk on the sensor, it says if I push the button. So they say, okay, wait a second. What about a camera? Kind of like up. So they say, wait a second. If I walk into the camera frame knowing that I am going to trigger a crosswalk, that's a problem. But what happens? Well, that would be randomized and that would be annoying to drivers, right? If we said every five minutes, it's hurt, the city won't do that. That would work in many places. But a city does not want complaints that the crosswalk keeps turning red and there's no one there. And it's a busy street. So another answer is what? Let's figure out within these options of how we can do it. And here is the solution that they figured out. This was figured out in Jacksonville, Florida. And in Phoenix, we copied them. In Jacksonville, Florida, a mother and daughter walked to Shul on Rosh Hashanah in a crosswalk that actually was with a red light. 
There was a crosswalk that said, do not walk though. Didn't give it enough time for someone to cross the street unless you push the button. They're walking in the crosswalk and a driver hits them. One of them dies. The, the shoal there is like, how do we fix this, right? This was in the crosswalk. So they go back to the Department of Transportation and they figure out that we can use this camera and then have a randomized delay. So therefore, when I walk into it, I didn't cause it. Rabbinic wise, this could still be an issue, but because of a safety issue, we will move away the rabbinic prohibition. And that is how it works here. So when you talk about additional reasons to push off a rabbinic decree, safety being always so important, life, that was a reason why these crosswalks are fine. Now, is there going to be a rabbi that doesn't like that? Of course, there's always going to be a rabbi that doesn't like that. That's the living Judaism that we have. People take more extreme opinions on things because they have a text that says something like that, which is fine. And so there are two ways to go about this in life. Shop for a rabbi, right? Find the rabbis that always give you the answers you like or be consistent with your rabbi, which is the healthy way to do this, right? And by the way, you can do this with doctors too. One doctor says, no, smoking is bad for you. And another doctor says, one cigarette a day won't be a problem, right? Obviously, cigarettes are bad. And so even the rabbis that are saying you can use this are not discounting the fact that Jewish law is not saying to do this, but because of the extenuating circumstances, do it. That's the short answer. So the, the scooter, kind of, again, I don't know the technology of the scooter, but it's the same idea that as an individual loses that mobility, what can we do within the framework to give them life? Right? We know how important socializing, how important community is. And so if we want to allow a person to get to Shoal who is ready to use this, let's create the technology for it. Is every single person going to use that? Probably not, but so what? That's the government. The original idea of drama came about at the hospital, hospital door, the automatic. Right. And Orthodox doctor goes through these doors, and they open automatically so that it presented the question, you obviously have to go to the door, you're a doctor, in any way of modifying the second Oh, that's how they started their, or oh, interesting. He's giving the original reason why this institute opened up. Interesting. But my problem is that there is another little bit of modern modification of these ideas. If it's not done directly, but you know it's going to happen, Okay, so <laughs> so when I bought the scooter, I told the guy, "Well, you telling me you are not doing it. The, I'm, I'm not doing it directly because there is a few second delay from the time you push the button until anything happens. Even when you change the speed, it doesn't very uncomfortable." It doesn't happen to the system. And so I told him, I said, that's correct, but not correct. Because you still know it's going to happen. As we said. So one second. So then why, if you have this problem, why are you using it? Meaning if you personally have a problem with it. <laughs> so I said to him, the only solution is if you don't know when it's going to happen which means randomize the process. Israel does have a scooter that randomizes and never turns off. I'm, I saw a friend of mine using it, very uncomfortable, but that's the only uh, legalistic right. approach, saying, I don't know when it's going to happen. The fact that it's in one second or two seconds, it's irrelevant. Fine. Right. It's there. Sometimes it's one second, sometimes it's two. How about self-driving? 
So hold on. Before that, so really what you're saying, which by the way, our crosswalks are randomized. Some people wait a minute, some people wait four minutes. Um, and it's randomized because it also connects to other crosswalks, kind of part of what we were talking about, making sure lights stay green and there's a flow of traffic. But going back to that, to just talk about, again, these are modern issues with an ancient law. I walk by houses that have, I walk home on Shabbat, right? I walk by a house that has automatic lights, it's motion censored. Do I have to cross the street? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I know, I'm activating it. So this goes back to one of the things you mentioned, and that is there is there are times that, that have nothing to do with you. Malacha, she'ena, tzricha, lagub. I walk by, but I had no intent for that. I have nothing to gain from that. And so most people tell you you don't have to cross the street. If you want to be that person across the street, that's fine. But I don't I don't cross the street for that. I'm just using that example. My own home, I won't have a motion sensor in my driveway because that's me. But someone else's home, I'm not controlling how they do it. So these are just tiny examples of how we can work within the framework of the law to make it as easy to live within the law. And so these are great examples. The Shabbos elevator is really the classic that most people know about. You go into electric vehicles. That's a great question. Um, so far, the answer is we don't do that. It will be interesting um, to find out if they're working on that so much. No, I think it's it's an amazing thing, right? People who want to go to Shul and they're far from Shul, can they do that? I do believe that part of that might require an Eruv, which is the boundary for carrying. No, I'm talking about even the cars, which you're now you're talking about people can get 20 miles. Um, so again, that's for, I don't know the details on that. I can tell you that if you want to talk about modern Jewish law addressing, when I say modern Jewish law, I say Jewish law addressing a modern problem. We could talk about value systems and morals and ethics of autonomous vehicles, which will be a conversation because they are going to be programmed how to play out in situations. So that electric car should have to be started. Yeah, but I'm saying, let's say it showed up. <laughs> but I'm not going into that one. I'm talking about something that I do know a little bit more but about. Can, but you can't take an Uber. A guy is driving it. Yeah. Electric vehicle, by the way, I just want to put something out there. Vehicles are, vehicles are a different issue. Let's not, before we talk about electric, gas vehicles are going to be its own issue. Every time that guy pushes the gas more, fire, right? The combustible engine part has to work because of weight. So let's, you know, not to address cars because I don't know enough about it. My question is, does God really care? Think that that's important? Well, let's talk about that in a minute. You had a different question? I will address that. Uh, I'm just about this. What about a bus that comes to a bunch of points? And um, anybody's waiting for it or not. So, so right. So uh, electric buses and gas buses require more effort on the engine and components due to weight. So that will be part of the conversation. Really, the trolley is a great example for that. All right. There is there are people who are very concerned about that. And you shouldn't use the war on Shabbos, particularly in Israel. No, no, this is these are very good points. Not to go, I'm not going down this rabbit hole because I don't know enough. I'm just giving you one idea of what could have been a, a, a problem. But there are real questions of refrigerators. Every time you open the door, the compressor or fan kind of adjusts accordingly. And so you have Sabbath mode on a lot of refrigerators because of this. Not just for the lights that turn on when you open the door, but because of the temperature changes. And so, yeah, there are people who try to address this one thing at a time to the best of their ability. Sabbath mode literally turns off the lights. It doesn't address anytime you open the door. Typically, your refrigerator computer system knows that. This ignores that now. Um, and therefore, it just checks temperature on its own, on its kind of schedule. It turns off the ice machine in some. Right. By the way, our freezer, our freezer at Chabad is like that. It used to work, and not because of Shabbos, it was broken. And so this is how they fixed it. And now 
every 10 hours, I think it goes into defrost. It just, just, <laughs> so if you ever need a freezer, call me, but, uh, that was literally because it's broken, not because, um, you would ask, does God really care? I think that's a great kind of question. And I think there, I'm going to go with one kind of answer to this in relationships. We look at our Torah as opportunities of relationships with God, avenues to have a relationship with God. And so I've shared this answer here before. It's it's always my go-to answer for this question. If I am married, I am. If I am married and my wife says, hey, you're going to the store. Can you please get for me a pastrami sandwich? And I come back. And I bring a tuna sandwich or I bring a corned beef sandwich or salami, whatever it is. I didn't bring that. And my wife says, I thought I asked you for a pastrami sandwich. And I say, what the heck? You're hungry, right? What does it make a difference? What sandwich I brought for you? You're not going to be hungry after you eat it. That's an answer, right? It's a bad relationship if that happens, right? All right, because the relationships are about the details. Relationships are about the details. Every detail matters. And every detail that you kind of go above and beyond those details, it builds that relationship and that love. So when we look at the Torah's mandates of mitzvot, these are opportunities to connect to God. The word mitzvah does not only mean commandment. It comes from the word connection, tzavsa. And so therefore, every single avenue that you find in the Torah are avenues of connection to God. It's a relationship. And in a relationship... The details matter. So besides for the Torah being a blueprint, this is the world and this is the manual to how this world operates and follow these laws. This world will operate efficiently and become better. More than that is it's a connection to God that we have an opportunity to connect and every single mitzvah is another avenue. So because of this idea, I also have that same answer that I answered to you before about the, the preliminary prayers. On the one hand, I can be that guy who says you're doing it all wrong because you're skipping, right? On the other hand, I can say, no, it's so beautiful. The mitzvah that you are doing, you're connecting to God. Can you connect with more avenues? 100%. Are you missing 10 pages of a connection opportunity? Maybe. But let's focus on the connections that you are doing. And so therefore, just to kind of end off on this idea, which I loved. I once read this thing and I'm like, wow, this is a very powerful message about kosher. Somebody asks you, do you keep kosher? And you don't, let's say. And so the typical answer that you give is no. But with this kind of paradigm shift of an answer of how our connection to God is each thing on its own, you can answer that you do keep kosher. Sometimes you don't. And maybe it's most times you don't. But when you're keeping kosher, let's say the, the meal that you did in the morning that was just tuna fish and bread or whatever it is, was a kosher meal. And so when you're doing that time, when you're eating kosher, that opportunity, you are connecting to God. All the other times are just opportunities that you missed. But when you're doing it, celebrate that you're doing it. So yes, I know you would feel a little bit like you're lying if you said you keep kosher when 99% of the time you don't or 80% of the time. But really, we're not fooling anyone. The truth is, is that when you're keeping kosher, it's a beautiful thing and it's an opportunity to connect. So I know I always share this line. There's Taco Tuesday is like an American thing, right? Well, you could have kosher Wednesdays, right? You can choose a date of the week that you will focus on having a kosher me meal. And it could be breakfast, lunch, dinner. It could be all three, one, whatever it is, where you say, listen, that day I'm going to use the kosher items in my pantry. I'm not even talking about your pot and pan and this, are they kosher or not? Those are things you can eventually change for that one or not. The point is to celebrate each opportunity where you build this relationship. And so to answer your question, does God care? The answer is yes. God said, I need you. I want you, right? There are millions of people, billions of people in this world that were not chosen to effectually do what Jews were tasked with. But they also have an opportunity to have a relationship. Theirs is narrower. We have so many more avenues. We also have so many more avenues to mess up. But these are great responsibilities that when we seize the opportunity to connect within that, God says, thank you. You think God wants us to have sacrifices? We should build a third temple and sacrifice? Um, do I think? 
I, I only know what the Torah tells us. I don't, I'm not including my thoughts. The Torah says that there are over 400 commandments that we do not have today. And many of those, if not 300, are relevant through the temple. So clearly there are many more ways and opportunities that we are missing because of that service. So that's my short answer to your question. Do we understand how that is meaningful? I did not answer that question. Is it sacrifice children? Never Jews. Not Jews. No. So that's not, uh, that's not a good line for me. All right? Abraham clearly was told we don't do human beings. Yeah. So is there a Hebrew word for rationalization? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. First of all, there probably is. <laughs> I just don't know it. Is there? It's human beings always rationalize, right? We always do that. In fact, yes, there. Is, I'll tell you what, there is a concept. I don't know about word for it. It says a person always makes themselves righteous. Right? We will always find a way around. A, I don't want to say even a way around. We're always going to find how my way that I just did is right, right? Ain Adam Matzik et Atzma. Exactly. So that's, I think, kind of the concept. It's not rationalizing, but it's that we will find why I just did. I'm just going to give a great example. You know, you ate something not kosher and you keep kosher. And so you say, oh, I needed to do that to save my life. When really you could have had carrots, apples, and whatever else. I've right? been said, no, I need to have the meat because I need to. So we always are going to find the favorable way to look at something, which by the way, the beautiful teaching within Judaism is when you look at Hillel's teaching about loving your fellow as yourself, his teaching is very profound. His teaching says what you hate done to yourself, don't do unto others, right? Really what it is, is it's teaching us something else. It's saying when you look at yourself and you are so quick to say when you did something wrong, why it was right, do that exact same thing to your friend. When they do something wrong, Find the way that that was right. Look at them the same way you look at yourself, which is, by the way, not easy. That's, uh, that's a comment. Yeah. The prophet did not like Kobanah. They did not. They chastised you. Hold on. God made your, your animals. They spent almost every Where do you, which ones? I think you're taking it out of context. No, 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 no. Hold on. They were sacrificed. Of course, but. But at the same time, the father says, God doesn't really want your sacrifices, but he wants you to do good. He wants your heart. To do the right thing. So. You gotta have the context. So, so really, we didn't really touch the sacrifice conversation, right? What are sacrifices? Why is it today that we still offer sacrifices of our lips? And what was a sacrifice when you brought an animal and you sinned, and therefore you brought a sacrifice to the temple because you sinned? What is this animal? How does this animal help your sin? You're right. The idea is it, it, there's a couple of things that that are taught about it. Number one is this should have been you. That's one of them. Meaning this was meant to put you in a mindset to really repent. Does the animal do the repentance or do you do the repentance? So again, I'm not, I didn't go into the sacrifice conversation in depth, but we could do that. I could bring text for that. What was your thing that you were going to talk about today? <laughs> well, I, you know, there's a lot of thoughts, but I did teach a class yesterday on dreams. So I have that, you know, very fresh uh, on my mind. And um, Rabbi, yes, when Abraham was told by God to bring Isaac for a sacrifice, and just as he was ready to stab Isaac, God said, You have proven your love for my commandments. That should have been the end of it. Man should have understood that they have to believe in God because that's the true being who tells us what we're doing or what we're supposed to be doing. That should have been the end of it, meaning we need no more sacrifices? Right. And sacrifices a bit eventually were eliminated by... By who? By different generations. Well, we sacrificed in different ways. 
I think that after the temple was destroyed, people still sacrificed, not Jews, because for Jews it was forbidden, but nations still sacrificed. There are still tribes that sacrifice today. They even do human beings. So I, those, but we would say those people are not enlightened, right? That's the word we'll use. We are an enlightened society. We don't do that anymore. Animals have more rights than human beings in some people's minds. I remember a conversation a couple of days ago with someone who told me that, you know, the story of the young child that fell into the gorillas, um, the oh, gorillas, yeah. was that in the Bronx? Where was that? Somewhere east. Yeah, a, a young child climbs into the enclosure of the gorilla. And what do they do? At first you see the gorilla pulling this child. And then eventually the gorilla kind of is very protective, but they kill the gorilla, right? Why do they kill the gorilla? Because gorillas are very powerful beasts. And in a moment, it could just crush this child without even the, doing it on purpose, technically, or with purpose. And so the instant fix is to kill the gorilla. This person told me that they should have thrown the mother in. Huh. Right? Why did the gorilla deserve that? <laughs> My point is, is first of all, first of all, as a parent, as a parent, children run away, right? right? And it's who knows, you know, if you tell me this, yeah, I don't know the circumstances, but number two is on our pecking order in life, human beings are above animals. That doesn't mean that animals should ever be mistreated. But if we're choosing one or the other, how could we ever say that we shouldn't kill the, the kill the gorilla to save the child? And the minute we lose that, we have a problem. We have to know what is most important in our value system. And so it, it is true that today you really do see people, and there's nothing wrong. This is not saying that people who are very big advocates for animal rights are wrong. But at the same time, we have to know when you're one to the other, which one is first. And there are people who would save their, their animal before they'd save a human being. And that's because of attachment. And, and I'm not judging. Maybe I am, but I'm not. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I am. But the idea is, is that we have to know in, in our world, there is a system, right? What is at the top? The human beings. And even the most and worst human being has more rights than an animal. And we should protect them and save them. They just became one step higher. No, no one case, a very well known case. Okay. Somebody comes to you with a uh, I want you to kill that guy. If not, I will kill you. What do you do? So the family basically said, well, your blood is not right. Right. Blood. right. But it's, it's a problem. Should you sacrifice your life? So I will tell you, this is this is a great ethical <laughs> it is a great ethical question and I always love the answer the the final parts to this question okay so this is standard ethical dilemma your life or their life and so technically you are given an opportunity to take someone's life to save your own by whoever's wielding the power here let's say you screwed up right the torah tells you like like you just mentioned your life is not any better than their life and therefore you cannot kill someone in that situation who has nothing to do with you he's not wielding a gun at you it's some random third party you can't kill them for that. However, let's say you had a moral failure and then you went and killed that person to save your own life. Can you be prosecuted? This is the power of the beautiful part of, of the Jewish law in this. The answer is you did the wrong thing, but you won't be prosecuted. So it plays out in a number of situations. There are three categories of Jewish law that this plays out in. The three carnal sins, as we call it. And that is murder, right? It says never kill someone, right? The other one is forbidden relationships. And the third one is idolatry. Someone comes over to you. This is probably the most common in Jewish history. Bow down or be killed. And most people, I don't think anyone can really answer what they would do in that situation. But throughout our history, so many people have been killed for that. But there are plenty who have also succumbed and bowed and then live their life. And so the Torah never said, you did the wrong thing, right? Technically, you bow down to an idol, 
that's a, a death penalty in Judaism as it is. But you'll never be punished for that. Because as much as we know what the right thing is, it's a very high expectation. And we don't know that you'll overcome that challenge. So that's always a fascinating um, piece of Jewish law. Well, can't you say 